and welcome back to my channel. This is the, if I'm not wrong, fifth episode in the Tectonic Hazard and Processes series on my channel. If you've not checked out the rest, there'll be a playlist somewhere here, hopefully. If not, it'll be at the end of the video. So I'd recommend watching them in order if you need to know everything. But today's video will be all about understanding tsunamis. If you know anyone that might find this series useful or you just like learning things about the world, please subscribe down below. It really helps me out and I'm trying to hopefully get to the goal of a thousand subscribers by the end of the year. So if you could subscribe, that would really help me out. And let's get into this video. How are tsunamis formed? There's a large underwater earthquake along a subduction zone. This causes the seafloor to uplift, displacing the water column above. I'll try and put a picture here to explain this a little bit more. Most tsunamis are no more than three meters, but they can reach up to 30 meters in height. It moves quite fast as well, about 805 kilometers per hour. When it reaches the shore, it causes a vacuum effect, pulling all the water back, exposing a large amount of the seafloor. The water column then returns rapidly in the form of a series of large waves. The water column, a little definition, I'll put it here, is the area of seawater from the surface to the seafloor. What about the impact of tsunamis? Large tsunamis can travel inland for thousands of miles. It washes away the soils, undermining the foundation of buildings and roads and bridges, causing many of them to collapse. Tsunamis can completely change a landscape and often small islands are completely destroyed. Most tsunami related deaths are from drowning, but many people are also killed by collapsing buildings and being hit by large debris that's being carried by the water. Flood water can also lead to contamination of food and water, which can lead to a cholera outbreak. How can you predict a tsunami? Early warning systems are now in place at the bottom of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, called DART, D-A-R-T, which stands for Deep Ocean Assessment and Reporting of Tsunamis. Another method that they can use are surface buoys to see the size of the water column. There are also GPS antennas on the surface and there's a thing called a tsunami -ter. Case study time, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. This is rated as one of the world's worst natural disasters. The earthquake was off the coast of Indonesia at an estimated magnitude of 9.3. Its thrust heaved the ocean floor of the Indian Ocean by about 15 metres up. Due to the size of the earthquake and the speed and height of the tsunami, it meant that it affected an astonishing number of countries around the span of the Indian Ocean. What about this tsunami made it so different? It was especially large. The epicentre was really close to the coast. Low-lying coastlines meant that the tsunami was able to travel far inland and there were no early warning systems at the time in the Indian Ocean. And number five. There was also a lot less protection in Sri Lanka due to the removal of the mangrove forest, which had been destroyed to allow tourist development. What were the impacts of this tsunami then? Many, many coastal settlements were devastated. Infrastructure was destroyed, economies were devastated too, especially the fishing, tourism and agriculture industries. And this had an enormous environmental impact. The overall economic cost came to about 10 billion US dollars. So that is it for this video. I know it's quite a short one, but there's not too much in this textbook about tsunamis. So that is it from me today. Please subscribe down below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps me out. And I will see you same time, same place next week, Monday, 4.30 p.m. And we are going to be discussing why do some natural hazards become disasters? So I will see you in my next one. Bye guys. Thank you.